It was a sunny evening in 2012, probably late June. I had just graduated high school after turbulent four years, and my parents let me throw a little get-together in the backyard with friends and family to celebrate. In total, including myself and immediate family, probably 15 to 20 people tops. My dad had just finished grilling all the food and everyone had moved inside to a small screened-in porch area to eat, just in case it started getting buggy. Cliché, here's where it gets weird part. Everyone was just sitting around eating and talking and in good spirits. Suddenly, the sky gets very, very overcast. I live in an area where sudden storms aren't really a thing, and it didn't feel humid, so it didn't seem like a rainstorm of any kind. It was as though someone switched the sky to a flat grey, where it had been cloudless and sunny moments before. As soon as I noticed how grey the sky had suddenly become, a horrendously loud noise rang out across the sky. It sounded like a passenger jet engine was landing in our backyard. A hush fell across the entire group, and everyone looked nervously at each other. No one said a word. Even my dad, a six-foot-something Norwegian raised by Air Force vets, looked seriously, genuinely rattled. A look I had never seen on him before, and never have since. The even stranger part, it passed as quickly as it came, and no one spoke about it once the clouds lifted. It was as though time had frozen during that moment, and then everyone went back to normal sort of. The rest of the night just felt strangely off. Everyone acted kind of robotic, like actors in a play or NPC characters. The air felt tense. No one I've spoken to remembers it. Not my parents, my friends, my family members that were there. Even my sister, who remembers what she wore on the first day of kindergarten, didn't seem to remember. Even weirder, I forgot about it until now. I only remembered now that my parents are selling the house. I'm just sitting alone in an empty house in that exact spot, and the memory just came flooding right back. I remember rushing to the window with my friends to try to get a look, but I straight up don't even remember if I saw anything or not, which freaks me out that my own memory is so spotty. I finally got in touch with one of my friends and asked her to remember my graduation party as hard as she could, before I talked about the event. She remembered it down to the overcast weather etc, but didn't remember the actual sound itself until I mentioned it. I tried to transcribe her exact words as best as I could while she told me. Yeah, wait, I vaguely remember something like that. I remember a really loud noise like a plane landing and everyone just being like, what the fuck was that? Holy shit. Kind of looking at each other. And then afterwards, brushing it off as a plane since no one knew what it was. But we all looked and I didn't remember seeing anything outside. It shook the entire house down to the nails in the floorboards though. Everything was rattling like crazy. That same year, 2012 in mid-July, I heard loud bangs coming from the sky late at night. I know it wasn't thunder, because it wasn't rainy or humid out and hadn't been all day. It definitely didn't sound like thunder either. You know the sound of a dumpster getting slammed back down after it's lifted by a truck? It was like that. Loud, but sounding like it was coming from a small area, directly in front of my neighbour's house. I saw flashes of light right afterwards. It was loud enough that I asked my mom if she had called the neighbours, but she hadn't heard a thing from inside the house. So yeah. That's what my friend said. In my other post, I read that someone else from Eugene, Oregon, the opposite coast as me, I'm in the northeast US, experienced similar events later that year in December 2012. A lot of people were suggesting covert government or military activity. LRAD and Gabriel's trumpet were amongst a few mentions. Many also reported a generally unsettling and insidious feeling throughout and beyond 2012. My thoughts on that? Could this be a government or military activity? I live near a small military base that is used as a weather station, and for the local CAP program, pretty much the Air Force ROTC for those unfamiliar, nothing other than small two to four passenger Cessna planes or the occasional helicopter ever takes off from there. It simply isn't large enough, and I've personally jogged the entire perimeter within CAP in high school. During my entire 15 plus years living in that house, there wasn't a single aircraft loud enough to hear from the base. 
One thing that might be unrelated, but is definitely worth mentioning. I also live near a long abandoned Air Force data center. It's in a restricted area, deep in the middle of a forest preserve. The buildings have been entirely gutted, but remain standing. Too hazardous to the environment to be torn down. There are also a ton of large World War II era storage bunkers along the trail, all locked up tight. I used to hike up there a lot with friends to spray paint, do drugs, other hood rat shit, until we started hearing loud bangs at all hours throughout the woods that would reverberate across all the trees. One of the final straws for me was one afternoon when my friend and I were up there alone, and a small yellow helicopter looking drone hovered over us from about 150 to 200 feet in the air. It stayed locked on us even after we noticed it and ran inside one of the buildings to get away. After that, I noticed it started becoming more heavily guarded by intimidating looking park rangers, literally down to the cartoonishly large white vans and tinted sunglasses. But I got the sensation it was being guarded by something else, long before the drone slash ranger slash any of that. I always felt like I was being watched up there. This happened when I was 11 or 12. I'm 28 now. And I was staying the night at my friend Danny's house, who lived just a few houses down from mine. There was a large pond behind our neighborhood, and we spent a lot of time there growing up. We'd go fishing, ride bikes, explore the small forest, etc. But we really enjoyed catching turtles and tree frogs. Might sound weird, but what can I say? We had somewhat of an obsession with reptiles and amphibians. Another thing I should note is that there was an old Native American trail that went through all the backyards in our street. It wasn't the Trail of Tears, but it was related to it in some way, I don't really remember. Back to the story. I was up late playing video games with Danny, and after a while we wanted to do something else. It was close to midnight, but we decided to go out and try and catching some tree frogs. A family that lived in a nearby house had gone on vacation, and they had a perfect backyard for catching frogs. We hopped their fence and started exploring. Almost immediately, I started getting a weird feeling. I had the feeling we were being watched or something was nearby, and there was this odd energy in the air. I don't know how to explain it, but something just felt off. I remember feeling afraid, but I had no reason to be. We'd done this kind of thing many times before and it never inspired fear. About 10 minutes in, we thought we heard the frog saying, help me in a croaky, froggy voice over and over again. The weird thing is, we couldn't see any tree frogs with our flashlights, and the yard wasn't that big. They started chanting in unison, and that made it much louder. Feeling more than a little creeped out, we bolted out of there and back to the street. Now, we were standing under a streetlight on the street corner, across from where the frog house was. I looked up at the light, and noticed at least 15 dragonflies attached to each other, like the human centipede. They were doing a spiralling motion as they flew closer and closer to the light. It was weird. So we heard and saw two unusual things, but you could possibly explain them away. What happened next, however, made absolutely zero fucking sense. After the dragonflies did their thing and flew away, Danny and I remained standing under that streetlight. We began talking about the strangeness of the frogs in particular. We both heard them croaking the same phrase, and we were pretty much just saying what the fuck was that about? At some point during the conversation, I was instantly overcome with the most intense adrenaline rush I've had in my life. That feeling of fear without a source while at the frog house was back, but much, much stronger. It was like my fight or flight response was signaled for no reason. Once again, Everything felt off and it felt like there was intense energy all around us, making the hair air heavy. I was terrified and I found out later my buddy was feeling the same thing. I became as still as possible, listening intently to my surroundings. I didn't hear anything unusual, but I suddenly began to feel drawn to look at the street behind me. I knew something was there. Whatever was behind me was the source of my fear and it was putting out overwhelming energy with its presence alone. I hesitantly turned around and looked. I have full body goosebumps just recalling this. In the middle of the street, about 20 yards away from us, there was an ordinary looking five or seven year old girl with long, 
dark black hair, wearing a white nightgown. She was sitting Indian style on the street pavement with a doll in her lap, and she was combing the doll's hair with a hairbrush. I was pretty much terrified beyond imagination. I was frozen with fear and could barely think straight. There was an incredible amount of energy in the air, and I knew something wasn't natural. She looked innocent enough, but I felt like she would snap me in half with the snap of her fingers if she wanted to. Another creepy detail was that she never even looked at us. She kept her head down and focused on her doll, but she definitely knew we were watching her. After what felt like an hour, realistically probably 15 to 30 seconds, a car turned onto the streets and began heading down the hill towards the girl. I remember the headlights getting brighter and brighter as it approached her. You would think maybe I would try to save her real quick, but I legitimately couldn't move. Also, I didn't really expect to get hit for some reason. I never felt like she was in any sort of danger. Eventually, she became lost in the car's headlights, never looking up from her doll this whole time, by the way, and the car just passed right through without any sign of a collision. It stopped at the stop sign 15 feet from us and made a right turn. We took our eyes off from where the girl was as we watched the car turn. When we looked back to where the girl had been, she was gone. Instead, there was a dog on the sidewalk precisely parallel to where the girl was sitting in the street. The dog was looking right at me when I noticed it, almost like it was waiting for me to see it. Then, it just turned around and trotted up the hill in the other direction. After a few seconds, the shock wore off and we sprinted back to Danny's house and spent half the night looking out his second story window towards the street. I don't know what I saw, but Danny saw the exact same thing. I've always felt like there was a reason it happened for some reason, or a reason it showed itself, whatever it was, to us of all people. Last thing, the house was in front of where the girl was seen was haunted. I lived on that street for 10 years, and 4 or 5 different families lived in the haunted house during those 10 years. All of them said it was haunted. I have a couple of stories about that too, but this is already way longer than I wanted it to be. Technically, exorcisms are rituals done by ordained priests, but they did exorcisms with priests, deliverance rituals if without a priest, visited haunted places for research, etc. We had a storage and collection of occult items, cases being documented and reviewed by their ministry. They guested in schools, institutions, prisons, for example, talking about the importance of spiritual wealth warfare. My dad also had a meeting with the late Pope John Paul II in Rome back in the early 2000s and appeared in local media from time to time. They also did pilgrimages, local and international, alongside talks focusing on spiritual warfare. I have tons of photos to support this. He was like the Warrens and John Constantine combined. So I'll be focusing on my perspective growing up in a very religious family, a life filled with preternatural and supernatural events, which also might have led to my father's demise, as per the team of the chief exorcist of our archdiocese, who handled my dad's case in the end. I'll be going back to some history first, as documented by his ministry and the accounts of my uncles and auntie. He grew up with some abilities, as simple as turning the TV on and off using his mind, to being an experienced practitioner of astral projection. With astral projection, he was even able to help the military to locate a plane crash by giving exact coordinates in a rural mountain region, and identified the bodies by directly speaking with the victims, no survivors, since he worked for that airline too. With those abilities, a group of cultists was able to locate and identify my dad, through astral projection as well, insane, and went to our house and tried to recruit him. He was open arms with them until he felt so much negative energy emanating from these people. He drove them away and felt he was starting to get possessed and tried to run over our maid with the car. Now coincidentally, his priest friend came by. He was supposed to be a priest but left the seminary when my grandpa died to take care of my grandma just to visit him and witness my dad's possession and exercised him. This is when his spiritual path started, after his priest friend left. He had a vision of the roof opening up to the sky and saw St. Michael the Archangel, intense light, 
drew his sword and reached out to him. My mom and our maid witnessed this and were all dumbfounded. This happened in the early 1990s. He went soul searching for 40 days and nights in Mount Banahar, a holy mountain, where we met different personalities. Fast forward, all possession cases that our parish, National Shrine, receives were being led straight to our house. Not just that, local and international cases happened, as well as that my dad handled, in the years that came. Growing up, we were taught to pray exorcism prayers on the rosary, all in Latin since we're susceptible to attacks given my dad's exposure. It was a common occurrence to wake up in the middle of the night to pee and hear someone screaming at our garage where the cases were being handled and would just tell myself, here we go again. Our house also became a gateway for spirits given the exposure of my dad to these entities. A lot really latched onto him, good and bad and also shared a good number of personal paranormal experiences with them. My dad passed away in 2007 due to kidney cancer. He only had four months to live after being diagnosed, from being normal to his passing. Many ruled out it was spiritual warfare, because when my dad was already bedridden, paranormal shit came by storm and was the worst. Five demonic entities were in the house, handled by the team of the chief exorcist of Manila. It was crazy. When my dad was also in the ICU, he practiced deliverance on a fellow comatose patient due to an entity harassing this patient in the hospital. I have so many stories to tell, specific cases and personal experiences being the son of this man. Though when he passed, everything died down. Paranormal and preternatural experiences happen from time to time, but not as often as when it did when my dad was still alive. I'm now agnostic for personal reasons, but demons are real. I'm 27, and I've been experiencing significant experiences and premonitions since about five years old. Although, my earliest vivid memory of a weird experience is when I was eight. When I was five or six, I just felt like I had a really weird dream. Something happened around that age range for me, but I don't know what. Age eight. Simply, I had a dream where a regular day happened, and then that day repeats itself. I always had a hard time getting up in the morning, so my mum yelled from a different room that I needed to get up. I wasn't getting up, Lil. Then my grandmother helped me up so my mum wouldn't get too upset with me. I finally sit up, slowly waking up and still dazed. So we lived in a two-bedroom apartment. It was me, my mum and grandma. My bed was in my grandmother's room since it could fit two beds, while my mum had her own yet smaller room. I have to walk past my mum's room to get to the living room, and while walking past, my grandmother says something to me. Can't remember what exactly. And so did my mom. Fast forward to school now. I can't remember specifics about the day, but the key part is that our class was especially loud and talkative, which annoyed our teacher. So we were threatened with recess being lost if we kept being loud. She walked out of the class to handle something in the school, and so we had it. We started off at a good volume, but over time got ridiculous and the teacher came back saying she could hear us from the hallway. The door was closed and so we lost recess. Day ends, back home, sleep. And then I woke up and the exact same thing started happening. Once my mom yelled at me again the same way in the morning and my grandmother helped me up, I started to notice the patterns. Except at the moment I had a clear memory of the whole day. So when I walked past my mom's room, I said what my grandmother was going to say and she looked at me like, how did you know? I shook my shoulders in confusion. I wanted to tell her and now wish I did, but I wanted to see if the day was going to end up like my dream. Despite that small moment, everything proceeded as I saw in the dream. So my mom appeared and I completed her words too. She was also surprised, but again, I just make it seem like I'm being weird and ignore their questions. Now at school, I'm sure I'm living the same day again. I spent most of class finishing everyone's sentence at times, but no one took any real notice. When the teacher left the room again, I told the class to shut the fuck up, or else we'll lose recess. I don't know. A lone eight-year-old kid convinced a class of 23-plus kids to shut up, better than most teachers. But it happened. I did it just in time, because around five minutes later, the teacher walked in and praised us for being quiet because she could hear us down the hall at first. 
but then got quiet as if she knew she was coming. From there, the day was completely different because we had recess. Ever since then, I've always had a fear I'd wake up at the age again, making this all a dream. Thanks, 2020. Age 10. This was my first time having premonitions while awake. I can't remember when exactly, but I know it was spring summer solstice because I was still in school as this happened during aftercare. I attended a private school that had aftercare where we would play outside or stay in the auditorium or cafeteria room until our parents picked us up. Anyway, it was a hot day and all of us kids are just kicking it. My friends and I are in the swing set that faces the black top where we all usually play games like dodgeball, etc. There were some kids playing soccer and all of a sudden I had a vision exactly like that so raven where I stared blankly and see what was going to happen with a bright yellow glow and vignette. And then it went away and I come back to reality. My friends noticed what was happening and was asking me what I was looking at. I point to a kid running with the ball and say, he's gonna fall in three, two, one. And then he fell and flipped over. My friends lose their shit and ask me, how did I do that? Of course it just happened and I'm just as confused. I had a total of five visions that day, but only remember three. The other one was seeing my friends sitting on the playground trucks and getting chased by bees. Specifically, I see my friends on the trucks and one of them yells, nothing's happening. And then they get attacked by bees from a bush. Once again, for this vision, it happened randomly. But this time, I didn't know when it would happen. My friends were all into my visions, so I told her what I saw. And so they ran up to the trucks and sat and climbed on them. A couple of minutes goes by, and then one of the girls said, nothing's happening and then they got bombarded by bees. At that point, we're all convinced that I can see into the future. Last vision was seeing the earth blow up, lol. If it helps, all my vision I had was from my perspective of where I see it, not any other angle. So if it is true, I guess I'll be in space watching the planet explode. Then again, three of the five visions came true if I'm correct. I definitely know, because I, I can recall feeling disappointed that not all my visions were accurate. Age 14, now. Since around 14, I would have random premonitions strictly in my dreams, and it would be for mundane things, like a lunchbox falling on my face when I open a cabinet, or having a specific conversation when walking in a theatre. I have become able to discern my deja vus when I experience in them, because I would intentionally try to remember them when it came from a dream or a sequence of events, actually repeating itself perfectly. And other times, I just sometimes know when something is going to happen, and thus I've predicted a lot of personal events or read people perfectly, even though I don't know them. I may have seen a spirit too. Oh, and some something winged demon like flying in the sky. But overall, premonitions have been the most consistent phenomenon I've experienced throughout my life thus far. This happened when I was a kid, and I'm 23 now, and it still gives me chills. Okay, so I'll jump right into it. Both of my parents were volunteer firefighters, and I practically grew up at a fire station around all sorts of first responders. This fire station was connected to one of the county police department's offices, which was a small four-room office upstairs with two entrances. A door that led outside and another that led downstairs to the bay area where the fire trucks were. Everything seemed normal and fine. Until a friend of my cousin and my cousin's husband, an EMT, used a Ouija board to try to talk to an officer that had just died a week before. So let me give you a rundown on this cop real quick before I get into the paranormal stuff that started happening after his death and the Ouija board use. So from what I remember of him, which isn't a lot, he was a pretty crooked cop. He would arrest people in the small town for drug possession and then he'd give the drugs to his son after they'd been processed into the system and counted so his son could sell them and they'd split the profit. This goes on for years and there's rumours but no proof of who was stealing the drugs until he died. This officer had a surgery and was taking stolen pain meds and accidentally OD'd. They found his body and a large amount of stolen drugs in his home. Okay, now to the paranormal. So my cousin told me about them using the Ouija board there. 
This officer's death was recent, so them doing this to talk to him, well, me, a kid who loved horror movies, was super cool and fascinated. The one key detail I remember from the story my cousin told me was that they asked the spirit who it was, and the spirit whispered the officer's name into my cousin's ear. For a while, I thought my cousin was messing with me to scare me, until a few months later, I had an experience there. So I was about 10 when this happened, maybe 12 at the oldest. I used to go work out with my parents at the fire station, because I was a chunky kid and the family doctor rode my parents' ass to get me to lose weight. Well, one night, we had finished working out and my parents got a tone to a house fire, and my mom agreed to stay there with me until my dad got back. So we're sitting there watching old training VHS tapes on the TV in the dark, and we hear loud stomping upstairs. My mom and I immediately froze and looked at each other, because we thought it was just us there, and we're pretty sure it's just us. It was bizarre. The stomping would start in one room, then stomp to the other. Filing cabinets would open and slam, doors would open and slam almost as if it was looking for something. Then the stomping got to the middle of the room and stopped. It was so quiet you could hear a needle drop. The way this fire station was set up, there was a ramp that went down to the bay where the trucks were. So my mom and I are sitting there in silence, just listening. And we hear the door to the bay open and someone walking up the ramp. My mom got up and went to the open door that looked out into the hallway at the ramp and nothing was there. Not a soul. But as clear as day we heard a person walking up that ramp. Moments after that, every sink in the downstairs bathroom turned on. All eight of them. And I know someone will say it could have been faulty pipes. But do faulty pipes turn all the knobs on the sink? I don't think so. This all took place in the span of 10 or 15 minutes. We turned off the sinks and shortly after, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, my dad and all the other firefighters pulled into the fire station. My mum and I told my dad and everyone else what had happened, but they didn't believe us. They told us we were making it up and we were hearing things. Ever since the Ouija board was used there, the feeling of that place is just weird and creepy. Where before it seemed very familiar and welcoming, like a place of safety. So I never knew my grandfather. He passed away two months before I was born. He died in November of 96 and I was born in January of 97. And I'm the only grandchild he didn't get to meet in person. So growing up, I always knew who, who he was and I always assumed it's because I was told who he was when I was little, until I was 15. So I'm at a hospital visiting someone who just had a baby and somehow the topic of dead relatives visiting people in dreams comes up. My mother proceeds to tell a story of when my grandfather visited me when I was little. I got so emotional at 15, I had to leave the room in hospital entirely to collect myself after the story was told. The story goes like this, as my mother told it. I was playing in the living room one day while my grandma was looking at photo albums. I was maybe three at the time, and I walk over to my grandma as she's looking at a picture of her late husband, and I say, that's the man that plays with me in my dreams. My grandmother responds, what? I continue to repeat what I said before, but I add, before he leaves, he kisses me right here and tells me to be good. I gesture to the middle of my forehead in between my eyebrows. This is where my grandfather kissed all of his grandkids before telling them bye. Something I would never have known unless I was told or experienced. My grandmother freaks out and calls my mom at work and asks her if she had ever mentioned Herman, my grandpa, to me. My mother responds no and says, the only thing I've told him is that daddy is his guardian angel and he'll always look over him and I told him that the day he was born. My grandma proceeds to tell my mom to come home, so she does. Once my mom arrives home, my grandma pulls her to the side and asks her a bunch of questions, then brings her into the living room where I'm just doing three-year-old things. She then pulls me over and says, tell mama what you told me about this man, as she points to the picture of my grandpa. I responded, that's the old man that plays with me in my dreams. Before he leaves, he kisses me right here. I gesture to the middle of my forehead between my eyebrows once more. My mother and grandmother are now both freaking out as I continue to play with my toys. That's where the story ends. As far as I've been told, my mom never mentioned to me who my grandfather was, other than what she told me when I was born. I've always known who he was and had this weird connection to him. 
I guess since he never got to meet me, he made up for it in that way. He's the reason for my obsession with music. He was a traveling bluegrass musician in Kentucky. I was raised hearing stories of him singing and playing guitar. I've idolized him my entire life, so that story was very emotional for me to hear. I grew up as a mixed race, mixed culture child. My mother's a black female and my father a Native American. Traditionally, Natives are very in tune with the spiritual world. My mom not so much, mostly holding that good old Christian belief system and often referring to my dad's spiritualism as his crazy native beliefs. However, I've always connected to ghostly entities and kept quiet for the most part, not wanting my mother to refer to me the same way. I often called the entities my guardians when I was a child because whenever I did something stupid or unsafe, they, or some of them, would protect me. So I literally grew up not fearing the supernatural. Now, so you can understand why I was so comfortable as a child, I'll elaborate a little on my interactions. I was a latchkey kid, so after school I would walk home, lock myself into the house and then go about my day, feeding myself, doing my homework and watching TV. It wasn't uncommon for an elderly woman spirit to often sit down on the couch with me until my nana, grandmother, got home from work. It wasn't until my teen years that I realized that the elderly woman was my great grandmother who had passed six years before my birth. Throughout my lifetime, I've interacted with many spirits, most stuck in a loop, a couple I could interact with, and one that still terrifies me to this day. I had just finished my senior year of high school and had applied to a local community college. I was one of those students who balanced between poor enough to file for financial aid, but wealthy enough that I didn't get much, not enough to pay for all of my classes and books. So I started house-sitting our family and friends' animals to pay the rest. My mother's previous boss was one of those people. She loved traveling and would often do so two to three times a year for at least a month. She was retired at the time. She lived in a rural area with one neighbor close enough to contact just in case of an emergency. I had been to the house twice before when I was a child and both times I wasn't settled. My mother's boss, let's call her Amy, was a teenager during World War II and was placed in danger because of her parents' open objection of Hitler, so they fled to America. She's a photographer in her spare time. She adores Mexico and at the time was looking to move there. With that said, she had hundreds of masks hanging on her walls, all throughout the house accompanied with photos she took of cemeteries or gravestones. For a couple of years I experienced small things, voices, dragging noises, periodically things would have been moved. Nothing too terrifying. But when I started dating an old friend, I had him staying with me just to have immediate backup if something were to happen. When this happened, I was 21. My boyfriend had expressed some discomfort in being in the house, especially at night, to which I told him about the multiple spirits I had encountered there. I mentioned that none of them have been hostile, and as long as we left them alone, they would leave us alone, with the exception of the screaming man. He liked to stand outside of the window and scream around three in the morning, and I simply would ask him to quiet down. We were playing games on the second week of our stay, when my significant other had to use the bathroom. I opted to change into my jammies while he went into the darkness, when he screamed very loudly. Now, my significant other isn't easily scared, but he hightailed it back into the living area. He said that the dark entity that often stood behind the homeowner's bedroom door which happened to also be next to the hall that led into the house from the cars, had turned to look at him. It paused before getting bigger and started running towards him. Very strange behavior for the being, but I assumed we had upset it, so I apologized for bothering it. From then on, my significant other and I went to the bathroom together during the night. Fast forward to last week, things had gotten a bit more tense. Each entity started getting more and more agitated, until it seemed like our nights were filled with activity and our space seemed to shrink until it was the single bedroom. I kept my keys on the coffee table in the living room, my computer for school in the family room and a few toiletries. Those objects would appear back in my bedroom as if someone carelessly tossed them in. Spirits I had no problems with started running away or charging at me. Eventually, I took my significant other home to see if things slowed down. 
I didn't. By the time my two-month house-sitting job was done, I was exhausted and cranky. I left the house at ten at night, being that the family would be back around four in the morning. And during the long drive on the dirt road, a childlike figure slowly walked across. I paused, seeing the same dark shadow that guarded the entrance to the home, and watched as it ran across the road, taking the child figure away. After a second, I continued on my way home, not wanting to slow to a stop or leave the vehicle to investigate. Four days afterwards, I was chilling at my house finishing up my finals. My grandmother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and dog were in the bedroom behind me. My grandfather was at his aunt's funeral in Bermuda, and my mom was in California for business. I say this because I need you to understand. I was essentially alone and the only one awake. The sounds of someone dropping and dragging a large box echoed from down the hall. My grandparents have an ensuite bedroom. They had their own living room space where I was doing my work, a bathroom, closet and bedroom that hid behind a door, one that was closed. I paused in my essay, suddenly feeling the familiar unease that I associated at Amy's house. The dragging sounds never left what I assumed was my kitchen and I by no means went to investigate. But I'd never had a spirit follow me home, and that night, I didn't sleep, because that spirit didn't wish me well. When I did come out in the morning, I found my house sitting bag torn open with all my house sitting gear tossed about. Safe to say, I never sat for Amy again, and I hadn't experienced anything outside of the norm of what goes on at my house since. But there have been times that I can feel the hairs on my arm raise, like I was being watched when I'm at other houses. My family and I moved countries when I was young, and the first house we moved into in that country was about 40 years old, owned by a young guy. It was a rented property, and nothing out of the ordinary, other than multiple neighbourhood cats roaming around the dying garden with very much dead lawn. When we moved in, we were fine for a few weeks, and then it started. I had a really good relationship with my family, until we moved into that house. Everyone started to pick fights with each other, and when we were living there, nothing ever was going right. Everyone was on edge. The vibe was off. I sometimes saw pearly dust floating above me at night while lying down on the bed. I reasoned it as cars passing by, producing that reflection on the walls or something. But it was still there, even after the cars passed by in the street. I didn't think much of it at the time, and as a kid, I just thought we moved to a dusty old house. Then... The house would randomly get cold, and when it did, it would never get warm, despite the three portable heaters in the same room, and scarily enough, they were all functioning fine. And where it would get cold in the house would vary every time. At the time, we just thought that the construction of the house was old, and maybe we had thin walls, or the heaters were all defective. Then one day, I saw it. Before I get into details, I want you to imagine this corridor, right in the middle of the house, surrounded by bedrooms and bathrooms. Basically, this corridor had no natural light, and it was very, very dark if all the bedroom doors were closed. Going back to the encounter, I was in the bathroom washing my hands, and as I open the bathroom door to exit, I see this fog that resembles a human arm moving back and forth as if it was walking, and disappeared at the end of the corridor. A full arm stretching from shoulder to the tip of the fingers, moving as if attached to an invisible body resembling a brisk walk in that dark corridor. There couldn't have been some light coming outside from the windows, because it was in the corridor that didn't have any natural light available. Plus, it was daytime. Only after this encounter, I felt the shiver down my back. A genuine shiver that you get when you see something that you cannot logically process. I didn't share these encounters with my family back then, because I didn't want to scare anyone, and I was in doubt about the experience. When we found a new place and moved out of that house, I finally felt ready to share this experience with my family, jokingly saying that the house was haunted. I only got to know then that everyone had their same experience, seeing something in the air, nightmares, ghastly arms and cold spots. My mom would have nightmares of these black shadows trying to enter into the house while she would hold them back out. My sibling, who also saw the arm, 
told me that while the arm was moving away, exactly the same way I've described as above, he swears that the temperature in that corridor must have dropped in that moment, as he could see his own breath. I feel like this whole thing could be explained due to the stress of moving to a new country, I don't know. I'm just thankful we were only renting it temporarily, and that we were able to leave. About three years ago, my beautiful mom passed away. When she did, I got not only her ashes, but my dad's and my mom's dad's as well. Also last year, my mother-in-law, plus sister-in-law and two kids, moved in with me and brought the ashes of my father-in-law. Now they're all caught up on why I have so many dead people in my house. For the past year, once every month or two, I've woken up to something grabbing my toes. At first I would jump up and go to the end of the bed, thinking it was my daughter because who else would do it? But no one else would be there. After a few times of this happening, I decided that maybe it was my mom saying hello because she used to wake me up by grabbing my toes that way. So I tried not to freak out when it happened. Then, maybe two months ago, I was in the kitchen kind of late at night. I guess someone left the cupboard open because it was open. And I kid you not, a cup came out of my cupboard and nearly hit me. It just flew out. It landed next to my foot. When I told my family what had happened, my sister-in-law laughed almost evil-like and said she thinks it was her dad messing with me because the cup was covered in pictures of butterflies. And any time they feel they got a message from him, it had to do with butterflies. So okay, my father-in-law doesn't like me. Then last night, I was laying with my daughter because even though she's 10 years old, I still put her to bed at night. And I dozed off for an hour or two. Then I just woke up for no apparent reason. Then, the covers pulled up my leg crazy fast and something grabbed a hold of my foot. I was wide awake and not just felt but saw the covers move. I jumped up so fast, I don't even know how I got my arm out from under my daughter's head. The thing or ghost or whatever grabbed my foot wasn't cold like I would think a ghost might be though. It was just like room temperature. What's going on? That doesn't happen to any of the other six people in my house, just me. Why? Is it my mom grabbing my toes and my foot? My father-in-law throwing a cup at me? Or could it be something else altogether? And should I be scared? About 10 years ago when I was in my early teens, I experienced my first and so far only paranormal experience. During the summer when this happened, I was visiting my father in Hungary with my two sisters. The night this happened was just like any other night. My grandmother was staying over and between her, my father and my sisters, all three bedrooms were taken, leaving me to sleep on the sofa in the living room. My sisters and I had just gotten back from a late night of hanging out with some friends and decided to get ready for bed immediately since we were all very tired. As I got into my bed for the night, my sisters continued talking quietly in their room with the doors open and the lights from their bedroom on. My father and grandmother were asleep. My father's house wasn't creepy by any means, but the one unnerving thing about sleeping in the living room in the dark was the fact that all three doors leading into it had a large panel of frosted wrinkled glass on the top half, allowing you to see fuzzy shapes or figures of people on the other side of the door. This made what I saw all the more mysterious and at the same time mis terrifying. Still wide awake, I looked up through the glass of one of the doors and looking as clear as anything I'd ever seen was a hooded figure staring right at me. Grey and featureless, it was standing on the other side of the door and perfectly backlit by the light streaming out of my sister's room. I immediately froze, unable to take my eyes off of it. The figure was clearly watching me, although it didn't have any eyes or face that I could see. Any defining features were obscured by some type of hood or shawl it wore over its head and shoulders. As I lay there frozen in fear, my mind quickly eliminated all of the possibilities of this thing being a human. Both my grandmother and my father were asleep and my sisters were still talking in their bedroom. Not to mention, why would any of my family just stand there looking at me without moving in the dead of night? After some time, 
I finally plucked up the courage to call out to one of my sisters to come, unsure of what else to do. She told me she'd be there soon, leaving me staring at this figure for another terrifying period. Then, just figures before she was about to step out of her room, and through the very same door the figure was standing behind, it glided away out of sight, and my sister walked through it as if nothing had happened. For me, this was the nail in the coffin that I witnessed some type of spirit, ghost, or guardian angel that night. The way in which it glided away on the other side of the glass was so unhuman-like in its movements. I know that what I saw that night was something paranormal. I was raised in a family that never once dismissed the paranormal. In fact, we all kind of reveled in it. I mean, hell, I remember at eight years old, my freaking grandma bought me my first ever ghost book called The Everything Ghost Book. So needless to say, I was pretty much always a weird kid. My family had always been superstitious and even sensitive to a point. My mom would always say things like, I have a feeling I'm going to see this person today and she would always run into them somehow. My first real experience started 10 years ago when I was 16 years old. My mom had found a cheap foreclosed house in a ridiculously small town called Ponce de Leon in Missouri, or as I like to call it, misery. Naturally, she fell in love with the house. My mom, my older sister and I moved in not long after. I was homeschooled at this time and I wasn't happy about moving to such a small rural area. When I say small, I mean I could literally walk to the town post office right around the corner, as well as the town church. Not to mention, you had to drive up a few hills to even get cell reception. Although I didn't share my mom's excitement about the move, the quaint town was kind of beautiful. It had a strange little cemetery and many natural springs and waterfalls as the town name suggests. Upon doing recent research of the town, I found this little blurb on wiki of how it got the town name and why people around the town joked about the water's healing powers. The community was founded circa 1875 as a health resort to exploit the mineral spring at the location. The resort was named for the explorer, Juan Ponce de Leon. The resort and town prospered, and with a population of around a thousand, it was the largest town in the country. We soon realised after moving in that the neighbours were pretty close-knit. Upon conversation with one of them, my mum had found out a few things about the house. It was built in the 1950s, and in the 1980s they started an add-on and it was turned into the Baptist preacher's personage, or a church house provided for a member of the clergy. This is the same preacher that spoke at the church right up the road. It was later sold to the prior buyers, then foreclosed and that's when we got it. Nothing more was said of what happened to the preacher. Now, pretty much immediately after we moved in, we started to update the house. We did flooring, painting, and all the things that come with buying an older house. We hadn't experienced anything unusual during this time. After we had gotten settled in and all renovations ceased, I invited my friend over to show her the new house. This is when my first experience happened. I started showing her around the kitchen, living room, bathrooms, etc. first, because I was saving my bedroom for last. As soon as I started to push my bedroom door open, we heard an object scrape across the tile of my bedroom, directly towards us. I looked all around, and that's when I saw a little LED book light by my feet. It's important to note that I strictly remember wedging that book light between two heavy books on my bookshelf the night before. And that bookshelf was at least 12 feet from my bedroom door. I remember my friend's face looking tense and uneasy as I tried to explain. I even marched over to my bookshelf and tried to understand the logistics of how it could have happened. Truthfully, there was no way I could explain it. And frankly, the fact that it was thrown in my direction specifically made me feel anxious. That event seemed to be the catalyst. Strange things started happening to not only me, but my family as well. When we started opening up about the whole ordeal as a family, all three of us started to realise we all had the same shared experiences. One we all heard when walking down the same hallway was a man's deep voice saying, Hey, in a rushed, loud tone. Anyone who has heard any kind of voice phenomena knows that it's so strange because it sounded as though it's directly in your ear canal. It's unlike anything else. Another common occurrence we shared was in the bathroom at night. 
When we had to wake up and pee, we all recounted hearing heavy footsteps, almost like a man in boots approaching the closed bathroom door. The steps would stop right outside the bathroom door and you could bend down and see the shadow of feet under the door. Then they would walk away. We also frequently heard the front door opening only to find it was fully closed. At one point my mom, being sensitive as I mentioned earlier, was laying in her bed at night, just about to drift off, when she had a strange feeling come over her. She got the image in her head of an older male. She mentioned she had an angry face, and you could just feel his feeling of anger and hostility. I think she came to the assumption it could have possibly been the preacher, though we have no proof of this. If it was him, I can certainly tell you he did not like me one bit. This is where my story and experiences turn a little darker. We had lived in the house for about a year now or so, and summer started to come around. I decided I wanted my own space and moved out to the separated garage space. It was a huge space that we never kept the cars in anyway. I remember completely making the space my own. I bought huge curtains, painted the cement walls, got a mini fridge, brought in a TV, a PS2, and most importantly, all my music equipment. I've always been a music lover and devoted a lot of my time to playing electric guitar in my early teens. This is something that followed me. Right about this time is when I found my love for classic rock, but what really intrigued me was its dark history. It had gotten to a point where my mom and sister barely saw me in the house anymore. I'd become a hermit in the garage, playing music and delving deep into research on my laptop. One figure in classic rock I was particularly engaged in was Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. According to a lot of books and articles, he was into the occult and followed English occultist Aleister Crowley. I often found myself falling down a rabbit hole and I started to feel so disconnected from reality. It was then when I became obsessed with that old idea. You know, the whole sell your soul to the devil and shred like a madman on guitar. One time while practicing, I believe someone or something gave me a small taste of what it would feel like. There was one solo in particular I had tried to play a few times, but could never quite hammer down. I'd started to practice it again one day and started playing almost all of the fast paced solos perfectly, almost without any effort on my part. I all but ripped my guitar strap trying to get my guitar off. It terrified me. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough for me to stop my isolation and research, though I didn't touch my guitar for a while. My friends that I had then were very like-minded, all very interested in the paranormal, occult, and otherworldly things. My garage started to be a safe place for all the friends I had, and there were plenty of long nights partying and partaking in things no one would be proud of but we were rebellious, defiant teenagers. None of us cared at that time. It was around this point I remember almost dreading going into the house when I had to inevitably take a shower or use the bathroom. In a sense, I didn't feel particularly welcome there either. I remember taking a shower one day, listening to Black Sabbath on a nearby iPad. The music kept pausing, so I would reach out and press play again. This happened about three more times when I finally yelled, I know it's you, stop doing that and it didn't happen again for the remainder of my shower. It could have been a coincidence or a technical fault for sure, but I remember being so bold towards what I thought was the old preacher man, almost fe feeling a hatred towards him. One morning when I was still sleeping in the garage, my mom busted through the door and started to throw all my things around. She was screaming, I don't know what the fuck is going on in here, but something's got to change. Something's not right. Her voice sounded angry, but I could hear the undertones of fear. Keep in mind, it's not like I had a huge pentagram spray painted on the exterior of the garage. As far as I knew, she had no clue of what I was looking into and what I'd been experiencing. The intuition of a loving and concerned mother, I guess. She proceeded to rip down my posters and grabbed random items of mine and threw them outside the garage door into the lawn. I remember this like it was yesterday because I think it finally hit me how far things had gone. And seeing my mom so upset and ultimately scared, I think knocked some sense into me. It was then that I also moved back into the house, as it was turning to fall and started to become too cold to stay in the garage overnight anyways. Ultimately, I purged anything that I had truly had any dark personal significance to me during my move back into the house. The last thing that happened, and probably the worst of all, happened to my sister. 
The only way I heard her story was by listening to her explaining it to my mom. Even though I was completely moved into the house now, my family still kept their distance. I knew they felt something too. I felt as if I really divided my family. My sister had a job that required her to get up early in the morning when it was still dark outside. She was smoking a cigarette on the back porch, which has a direct view of the garage and the steep hill that runs alongside the detached garage. She said she saw a dark mass low to the ground. She first spotted it coming from behind the back of the garage. It then started to charge down the steep hill towards the back porch where she was standing. She expressed to my mom she had never felt so much fear in her life. She quickly shut the back door. She also said she didn't believe it was an animal because it was charging towards her. There was absolutely no sound. No paws, hooves or sound of feet on the soft ground. The house seemed to go quiet after that. No voices or footsteps. Unfortunately, a few years later, my mom could no longer keep up during a harsh winter. Everything started to break and we didn't have the money to repair things. We couldn't even keep the house warm. We decided to get up and leave. Most of our belongings were still in the house when we did leave. We came back a few times on warmer days to grab some of our things and I started to see our old home become in a complete state of disrepair. Mold growing absolutely everywhere, paint starting to peel and all the hard work we had put into it, gone. It was harder for my mom to see. It was her first house she bought and it killed her to just abandon it. It eventually went back into foreclosure. When I turned 20, I got my first apartment that had to be blessed twice. I thought everything had gone back to normal at that point. I then met my now husband when I was still in my first apartment. He had no idea of my dark past and admitted to me that he felt something dark in my apartment. One night, it got so bad he said to me to pray over me. I've had two apartments since then and we both don't sense anything inherently dark. Sometimes I still wonder if it's truly left. I got in contact with a good friend who distanced herself from me during that dark time. I would actually consider her my closest friend. She recounts things very differently and said that I had definitely changed. She had a few stories of her own and things that I have said to her that were very unlike my true character. The crazy thing is, I don't remember saying some of these things. I truly don't think I knew how bad it had gotten. So this happened when my sister and I were in high school. We rented this semi-detached house for a few years with our mom, dad, and eight-year-old brother at the time. It was a newish area and was a very family-friendly neighborhood. Our house always gave me weird vibes in general, but I had no idea why. It was kind of small and the layout was weird. When you walked into the kitchen area from the living room, you had the actual kitchen, stove, fridge, table, etc. to the left. Then to the right side of it was carpet, and there was a little electric fireplace that didn't work. Our parents' wedding picture was hanging on top. We never used that space, so my dad put a Bowflex machine there, which made it even more ugly. Moving on, we bought a dog that year. She would frequently bark in the corner of our room, mine and my sister's, when nobody would be in there and it was pitch black. When we'd go upstairs to see, she would still be barking. It was like a scared or territorial kind of bark. As she barked, she would back up at the same time in fear. It was spooky, but I never saw anything, so I was just whatever about it. I also saw my brother come down the stairs in the morning, only for him to be sleeping in his room. Now, what I'm about to write is still unexplainable to this day. Our parents still do not believe us. We're all hanging out in the kitchen, my sister, brother and I, when suddenly, we looked on the wall in the weird carpet area, and there was a ginormous spider crawling on it. It was probably tarantula sized. We lived in Canada, so this was not normal for us. We were both like, hung, oh, let's take a picture of it because nobody's going to believe us. So my sister whips out her phone, and it won't turn on. Never happened before. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to go upstairs quickly to get mine. So I jolted up the stairs and came back down quickly. As I was coming down, I just saw the rest of the spider's body as it disappeared behind my parents' wedding picture on the wall. The thing is, we inspected this picture and it was literally flat against the wall. There's no way anything, especially a spider that big, could have fitted behind it. 
we were so confused and still are to this day. We've had a few weird experiences afterwards, but nothing crazy after leaving that house. My sister and I shared a weird dream once, and that's kind of where it ended. I was raised Baptist and was never allowed to have a Ouija board growing up. So after becoming atheist, I decided to buy one just for the fun of it. Still believing that any movement would be a result of the idiomotor effect. I played around with it, not much happened. So I just put it back in the box and shoved the box under my and my boyfriend's bed. Two or three nights later, I woke up to what sounded like a violent scratching or clawing noise and what felt like the bed shaking. As you know, when you wake up because you think you heard something, you'll hold your breath so you can hear better in the silence. Well, that's what I did. I held my breath, terrified, and it was strange because it was almost waiting for me to let my guard down. Because as soon as I exhaled and thought, whew, it was just a dream, the scratching and clawing picked up again. It was so forceful, it was shaking the freaking bed with each scratch. So I obviously freaked the hell out and wake up my boyfriend who was asleep next to me while the scratching paused again. As soon as I shook him awake, he could tell I was terrified just by the look of my face. He started to ask what's wrong and I just shushed him and whispered, shh, listen, just tell me if you hear it too. And we're both sitting there in silence. And once again, it was as if it was just waiting for our guard to lower because as soon as my boyfriend said, hear what? I don't hear. The scratching suddenly picked up 10 times harder, faster, and louder than it had been before. My boyfriend was braver than I was. He immediately hopped out of bed and turned on the light while yelling, what the fuck was that? And as soon as the light was on, it stopped. I immediately looked for a rational cause. I, don't, I didn't have any animals at the time, no kids, no TV or radio on. We lived in a brick house, so nothing could get in the walls. By ourselves, in the suburbs, so no weird wild animals or anything. There was no explanation. My boyfriend looked under the bed. He looked all around the house. He even looked around outside of the house just to try to find some explanation. But there was nothing. So my boyfriend and I eventually get back into bed. We snuggled up close and then he reached over to turn the light off. We laid there, listening for any hint of movement. And of course, as soon as my boyfriend relaxes and says, I think it's gone now, the scratching and clawing started picking up even more violently than before. At that point, we turned every light in the house on and went and slept in the living room. The next experience, experience occurred about a month after the first experience. My boyfriend was such a heavy smoker, he would literally wake up every few hours throughout the night to go outside on the back patio and smoke a cig. I'm such a light sleeper, it would often wake me up when he went out to smoke and then wake up again when he came in from smoking and crawl back into bed. It was probably around 2 a.m. or so, and I heard my boyfriend get up out of bed. So I'm trying to fall back asleep and I hear him put his shoes on. I hear him open and close the bedroom door. I hear his footsteps walking down the hallway. I hear him open and shut the hallway door, open and shut the back door, and I hear the back screen door open and shut too. All totally normal. I don't know how much time had passed, Probably not that long because I never fall back asleep all the way. But maybe 30 minutes later, I heard the screen door open and shut again, along with the back door. I heard the door at the end of the hallway open and shut. I heard his footsteps walking down the hallway toward the bedroom, a bit heavier this time as if he was stomping for some reason. Then I heard our bedroom door open and shut. Normally at this point, I would be hearing my boyfriend crawl into the side of the bed as he slept right next to the door while I slept on the other side by the wall with my back to the door. But instead, I hear him still stomping, walk around the bed and walk up my side all the way up to the desk and stop right there, standing in right in front of my face. My eyes were still shut and I was still laying there on my side, facing where he was standing, but still trying to fall back asleep. I figured maybe he was putting his phone on charge as the outlet is by my pillow. I don't hear him messing with any phone charger. I don't hear anything. I suddenly felt like there was somebody just staring at me, watching me. That's when the terrifying thought crossed my mind. Why is he just standing there in front of my face, doing nothing except watching me sleep? 
and I just got this sinking feeling in my stomach. Then I hear a voice whisper my name and telling me to wake up. It almost sounded like my boyfriend, but the voice was deep and raspy and almost distorted. I opened my eyes, and despite hearing him walk in and open and close doors and walk around to my side of the bed and stand there, there's no one fucking there. But it gets creepier. I freak out, jumping out of bed and running down the hall to find my boyfriend. And once I turn the corner to go running through the living area where the exit to the back patio is, I literally run into, like actually physically collide with my boyfriend. Turns out he was in the process of running inside to find me, while I was in the process of running outside to find him. Before I can even gather my thoughts to turn them into words, he goes, where were you? Are you okay? Did you hear it? I don't know what just happened. I came out to smoke and I guess I must have fallen asleep in the hammock or something because the next thing I know, I heard the patio door open and the screen door and it half woke me so I was just half asleep. But I heard you walk up and I felt you sit down on the hammock with me and put your hand on my leg. Then I heard you say my name and then you yelled at me to wake up and it sounded like you but I knew it wasn't your voice. Then when I opened my eyes, there was no one there. And I looked around and I didn't see you, so I panicked. So long story short, we both had the same unique experience at the same time in different areas of the house. Both of us thinking it was the other person, only for us to realize, also at the exact same time, no one was there at all. Which begs the question, who did both of us hear walking through the halls, patio and bedroom, if it wasn't either of us? Alright, heads up, this is by far my favourite, and in my opinion the most convincing experience. It's more akin to a miracle. It occurred probably 5 months after experience 2 above. Since that experience, I'd actually made a lot of progress on the Ouija board, and you could say I befriended the spirit in the house, Grio. It's a long story, but basically I told her out loud, if you want to stay in this house, you can make all the noise you want in the daytime, but not at night because it scares the shit out of me. Take it or leave it. And it worked. I worked hard to communicate over time and build a rapport of sorts with it. But those are stories for another day. The point is the spirit was no longer terrifying us and became more of a welcomed, although prankster presence. But keep in mind, in my head, I still partially believed I was just going insane and that none of this was real. Imagination, mental illness, Idiomotor effect, gas leak, brain tumour, something rational. The atheism was strong in me. Around this time, my boyfriend, who had been in long-term recovery from heroin addiction, ended up relapsing. I knew it, as I was in long-term recovery myself, and I knew all the signs, but he wouldn't admit it. I knew the only way he would admit it and go back to rehab is if I found evidence and confronted him with it. When he left for work one night, I knew it was a chance to find evidence. He would never take syringes to work with him, so I knew they had to be in the house somewhere. I searched for several hours and I was frantic, but after finding nothing, I was in tears, sobbing, desperate. So I had an idea. In absolute desperation, still in tears, energy still very high, good for spirits, I pulled out the Ouija board. I thought, this is my last shot. Here goes nothing while also at the same time kind of viewing it as a test to see if my paranormal experiences were legit, or if I was somehow making them up in my own head. Once I contacted that prankster spirit, I asked if he had seen, or would know, the location of something my boyfriend had hid recently somewhere in the house, like perhaps a baggie or syringes. When the planchet again went to yes, I just broke down and said straight up, please, I need help. I need to know where he hid those items so I can save his life. I swear to God, if you help me find those items, I will never ask you to find anything for me or do another favor for me ever again. Please, where should I look? And I'll admit, I felt like a crazy person. But to my surprise, it started to spell out a list of words. It spelled out basket, basement, trouser, laundry, fleece, sock, pocket. Then the energy died out. Again, that atheistic doubt in the back of my mind, thinking of the idiomotor effect, thought, that's a strange list for my subconscious to spell out. I don't even use the word trouser and we don't own anything fleece. To skip the boring parts, I searched for 90 minutes straight and was about to give up. 
But then while in the laundry room of my basement, I saw a basket underneath the rocking chair that I hadn't noticed before. It was a box of pants, or you might say trousers, all belonged to my boyfriend. I dug through and got to the last pair of trousers in that basket under the chair in the laundry room of the basement. It was a pair of jeans. And I shit you not, in the pocket, I pulled out a fleece motherfucking sock that I'd never seen before. And wrapped up inside that sock, I found two syringes and several empty gel capsules. What dope comes in around here? Once I saw that, a shiver went down my spine because I realized everything was actually real. The truth of spirits in the afterlife had hit me in the face like a bunch of bricks. I wasn't just crazy after all that. That was my proof that spirits were real because I never could have known that. Not a single world was incorrect from the Ouija board. Like I suddenly got the most terrified feeling ever. Just knowing that the spirit I talked to was real and was now certainly watching me make the discovery. Watching me standing there frozen in fear and awe and realization as I looked around the basement. I thanked it. And yes, that discovery did propel my boyfriend and eventually fiance into treatments. But unfortunately, in late 2017, my fiance relapsed one more time and passed away. But thanks to that spirit, I got to spend a couple more sober years with them. Otherwise, I would have lost them before then.